My name's Judith Bennett and I'm the head of the Department of Education and on behalf of everyone in the department, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the first event of the department's 50th birthday celebrations and it's a particular pleasure to welcome Professor Maggie Snowling, President of St John's College, Oxford, as the first speaker in our anniversary lecture series. Um, before I hand over to my colleague Benedetta Vassetti, who will introduce the lecture, I would just like to say a few words about the department. Uh, education is one of the founding departments of the university. I was looking up some facts and figures, and on the 9th of October in 1963, the university registered 230 students for courses in economics, English, history, maths, politics, and of course education. Things have changed a lot in 50 years and in fact the Department of Education alone now registers over 550 students a year. But I think the University of York and the Department of Education have done very well in their first 50 years. York is one of the world's top 100 universities, one of the best universities in the country for its research and teaching and last year it was awarded the accolade of being the best UK university under 50 years old. And obviously that's something that we've got to make the most of because we've already got one opportunity now, we are 50 years old. Um, the Department of Education is also ranked as one of the best universities in the UK for its teaching and research, and it continues to be a growing department. It's particularly good to be able to celebrate 50 years of education at York with the launch of our new Psychology in Education Research Centre and our Psychology in Education degree. Um, the department's got a number of events planned to celebrate its 50 years. Basically, we're going to make the most of it. Tonight's talk is the first in a series of public lectures with distinguished guest speakers. We've also got an event in March which will celebrate our work, work with schools, a birthday party in May, an academic conference in July, and a reunion for former staff and students in November. And our students are also working hard on a series of events. They're going to be raising money for a range of charities that support educational activity. So I'm very much hoping that the department will make its mark in 2013. I was just going to interject with a, a slightly more personal note. I, I was a student at York, obviously, when it was a much younger university. Um, my first few years were spent as a secondary science teacher down in London, in Wimbledon, and it was really good to see then what I thought of as my former university beginning to make a name for itself. But I would say if anyone had told me when I was a student at York that I would be back here now as head of department, I wouldn't really have believed them. But what it does mean for me, both personally and professionally, that it, to welcome you here to celebrate 50 years of Education New York is a particularly special moment, and I very much hope you enjoy this evening. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the colleagues in the department who have worked so hard uh, to organise our 50th birthday celebrations. And without further ado now, I'll hand over to Benedetta to introduce Maggie Snowley. Thanks, Benedetta. It is a great honor for, her, for us that Professor Maggie Snowling has agreed to give the first talk in this series. Maggie is, of course, a world-renowned expert on reading disorders. She had a, a fantastic career as um, an academic and a researcher. It all started with a first degree in psychology in Bristol, followed by a PhD at University College London under the supervision of Professor Uta Fritt. In 1989, Maggie uh, became principal of the National Hospitals College of Speech Sciences. In 92, she was chair and head of department of psychology at Newcastle University. And in 94, she came to York to a personal chair in psychology. And here she coordinated the, um, she co-directed the uh, Center for Research on Reading and Language, and she ran a clinic for <coughs> children and family affected by reading difficulties. Uh, she has received an impressive list of honors and prizes. Uh, she is a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. She has been awarded the British Psychological Society President's Award and the Samuel Orton Award, which is the highest award from the uh, International Dyslexia Association. Um, 
she um, has also been uh, an expert uh, on the, a member of uh, Sir Jim Rose, Rose's expert advisory group on provisions for dyslexia. So this is all quite impressive. What has Maggie actually done to, to deserve all of this? Um, she has done um, an incredible amount of research on developmental disorders of reading and writing. She has published extensively. Her work is widely, uh, has been widely influential and widely cited. Her research adopted a variety of methods and uh, um, the aim of her research has been to advance uh, our understanding of uh, uh, learning difficulties uh, in order to um, develop theoretically motivated interventions. Um, what makes Maggie's research great, I think, is her ability to uh, combine insights from theory and uh, from research and practice. And she obtains this by closely collaborating with practitioners and families affected by um, reading disorders. Maggie has never been afraid of developing her theories and changing them as new uh, research findings and developments um, came about. Recently, she has become more and more interested in widening her sphere of interest from the English-speaking world to other European countries as well as developing countries. Maggie has played an important role in spreading around knowledge about reading difficulties among students and researchers. Her um, book on dyslexia um, is nothing short of a classic, and it is compulsory reading for uh, students um, on uh, relevant courses, first published in 91 and then fully revised uh, in 2000. Um, it has been on the reading list of most of us. Um, another important activity uh, for Maggie has been nurturing uh, research talent and helping the next generation of researchers uh, who are sitting, some of them are sitting here and smiling in the first row. Uh, Maggie has been very active in developing uh, the next generation of researchers and her previous students and collaborators can be found in research centers and universities in the UK and as far as India. Um, sadly, uh, in September 2012, Maggie left, Oxford, uh, sorry, left uh, York uh, she didn't particularly want to leave, but I think she was forced because <laughs> I don't think she could possibly refuse to become the first ever woman president of St. John's College in Oxford, a college that had been around since 1555 without a woman president. So this actually brings me to the final point that I want to make about Maggie. Maggie has been a, a powerful champion of women's career in academia and in the wider society. And myself and many other uh, female academics uh, owe a debt of gratitude to, to Maggie for making it easier for us. So we really, uh, we're really honored to have Maggie here to talk to us about family risk studies of dyslexia, what they tell us. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you very much indeed for such a nice introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be back here in York, which I now think of as my home, um, and to be uh, contributing to this 50th birthday celebration for the Department of Education. Although it's somewhat disconcerting to know that I am actually older than the university, I am indeed extremely honored to be here. This is a university in which I feel my research and that of my group really flourished, and um, I'm very thankful to the university for that. When I was asked to give this lecture about dyslexia, it, it um, led me to reflect on the fact that more than 10 years ago now, I gave the Merchant Adventurers Lecturer here in York on the same topic. And actually to think how much has changed in the last 10 years in the field. It is a 10-year period, a decade in which I think there have been really quite significant advances and so what I've chosen to do tonight is to portray for you a more contemporary view of dyslexia than maybe you uh, are already uh, familiar with. Now, dyslexia, of course, has always been a controversial topic, and I'm going to duck the definition at this point in the evening and just ask you to perhaps have a neutral 
um, definition of dyslexia in your mind and think of dyslexia as a disorder that primarily affects the ability to develop uh, fluent reading. Um, and um, then we'll see where we can, we can go with that. So I think there are three facts about dyslexia which we can all agree about. The first is that it runs in families. Uh, the second is that, and we've known for now something like 50 years, that dyslexia is associated with a phonological deficit. That is a, a deficit in the speech processing system of language uh, in educational circles, primarily thought of as a problem with phonological awareness. And at the level of behavior, dyslexia has um, a variable manifestation. So in English, if a child has dyslexia, the first thing that will be noticed is a problem in reading aloud, a, a decoding problem. But if that child is learning to read in a regular language, like, say, Italian, that child probably will read accurately, but will have enormous difficulty reading fluently. If that child is growing up um, learning to read in Canada, which is a, an Indian uh, alphasyllabic language, which um, I'm now uh, studying with my colleague, Shanali Nag, this is a, a language with a very big set of characters, something like 400 characters, as opposed to our 26 letters. And so for a child in middle school who's having reading difficulties, they won't yet have mastered the symbol set. So clearly, dyslexia has um, a variable manifestation, but at the cognitive level, across all the languages in which it's been studied, it seems to be associated with a phonological deficit. And this, if you like, is something of a causal model. It suggests that at the biological level, there are genetic factors that affect phonological development, and this leads uh, to dyslexia. So it's what I'm going to call the classic model. But as we'll see that in the past 10 years, this model has become a bit more complicated. Back in 2009, Sir Jim Rose published a report, um, uh, a sort of a policy statement, really, about the nature of dyslexia, what kinds of interventions were effective for it, and what provision should be. And I was very privileged to be part of his um, advisory group. Now, in the report, uh, the group had to uh, come up with a definition of dyslexia. And uh, in addition to uh, describing dyslexia as a problem primarily with reading fluency and associated with phonological difficulties, the uh, group made some statements which are perhaps somewhat different from what the kind of layman's picture of dyslexia suggests. So the first thing to say is that dyslexia occurs across the range of intellectual abilities. And this is rather different from what used to be thought, which was that dyslexia was a very specific problem in a child without any other kind of learning problem. Secondly, dyslexia is best thought of as a continuum, not a distinct category, and there are no clear cutoff points. So it's not really possible to think of dyslexia as a discrete disorder, rather it's something of a dimension. And finally, co-occurring difficulties may be seen in aspects of language, motor coordination and personal organisation, but these are not by themselves uh, markers of dyslexia. And children with dyslexia often have other difficulties as well. They often have problems particularly with attention and organisation, but it, this it's important not to confuse those difficulties with dyslexia itself. They should be thought of as co-occurring. So really we've moved in the last 10 years to um, a framing of dyslexia which sees dyslexia not as a diagnosis but as a dimension from mild to severe. Dyslexia is not a specific disorder but one which occurs in individuals at all levels of ability and interestingly at all levels of language ability. And we've also found out that dyslexia is associated with multiple risks, not just a single cause. Indeed, the outcome for individuals with dyslexia depends upon a complex interaction of the risk factors that they bring to learning to read, interacting with what we could call protective factors. And of course, one ma major protective factor is education itself. So tonight I'm going to try to flesh out this contemporary portrait of dyslexia by beginning with a review of studies that have followed children at family risk of dyslexia. And then I'm going to consider um, the same issue, um, the relationship between dyslexia and language impairment in relation to our ongoing uh, family study um, of uh, children, the Language and Reading Project, which is still ongoing in York. Uh, 
that will lead us back to consider how we can conceptualise dyslexia and hopefully draw out implications for intervention. So let me start off with um, a review of findings from studies at family risk of children at family risk of dyslexia. So what is a family risk study? Well, the backdrop to a family risk study is the fact that reading skills are highly heritable. Um, indeed, um, there have been some genetic advances and some candidate genes associated with dyslexia have been identified. But because we know that dyslexia runs in families and it's highly heritable, it means that if you um, follow a child who's at, uh, born into a family where there's a first-degree affected relative, the probability that they'll become dyslexic is much higher than in the uh, typical population. Um, so in these family risk studies, you select children who are at family risk of dyslexia and you follow their progress in relation to that of children who come from families in which there's no history of reading problems. Um, in a family risk study, um, <laughs> the typical sort of end point is the point when children get to around about year three, around about eight years of age, and then they can be assessed and a decision made as to whether or not they should be classified as having dyslexia or having or being free of <coughs> dyslexia, essentially. So I'm going to refer to those two outcomes as family risk, dyslexia, and family risk, no dyslexia. And what family risk studies do, essentially, is to compare, um, to, to look backwards in time, to compare the um, performance of the family risk children who do and do not develop dyslexia in terms of their early language skills before the point of reading instruction. And this is quite an important um, methodology because it allows us to think about dyslexia and what predisposes a child to dyslexia before the point of reading instruction. Now, what we've done in, recently in a meta-analysis is we've looked at all of the studies which have been published, which have followed children at family risk of dyslexia and have got to the end point of classifying the children into groups. And these studies um, have been done across a number of languages, uh, five languages, and what's nice is that, that this family risk approach has been used in languages that are very <coughs> regular, like Finnish, which is the most regular language in the world, it's complete correspondence, systematic correspondence between letters and sounds, through Dutch, which is also regular, to Danish, which is pretty irregular, and English, which is extremely irregular, as you know, and also in Chinese, which is not an alphabetic language. And it's just a, as an aside of interest that in all of those languages, as I said before, these, um, dyslexia appears to be associated with a phonological deficit. Now, because we were um, in this review pooling across studies, it allows us to get a very robust um, estimate of the likely precursors of reading difficulty. And essentially, just briefly, what a meta-analysis does is essentially it, it looks at uh, the, um, the size of the dyslexic deficit, if you like, on a particular um, task, be it a language task or a cognitive measure, across a number of different studies, and it expresses the deficit in terms of a, the sort of average across those studies in a, in a standardized way called, um, which we call an effect size. And so I'm going to show you three graphs which um, detail the results of this meta-analysis. And they're all going to be of this kind of form. So let me spend a moment or two telling you what's on this, um, on this graph. So here we see um, the literacy outcomes of children at family risk of dyslexia at age eight, pooling across all the studies that are published. On the x-axis, we have the measures that have been used, word reading, non-word reading, and spelling, three measures of uh, what you might call word level reading, so that the basics um, of reading. <coughs> and on the y-axis, we have a measure of effect size. That's this standardized measure of the difference between, in the case of the dark bars, children with dyslexia and controls, typically developing children, in the case of the light green bars, children in the family risk group who don't develop dyslexia and the uh, <coughs> control. So the, the, the typically developing group are a kind of benchmark, so like obviously that's themselves. What we're, we're plotting here is the size of the impairment in these measures for the family risk children. And all this 
tells us is it's exactly what you would expect because this is the point at which we classify the children into being dyslexic or not. And you can see the dyslexic children show big impairments relative to controls. That's why we're saying they're dyslexic. But what's more surprising is if you look at the light green bars, you look at the children who are at family risk who don't fulfill criteria for dyslexia, you can see that on average these children still uh, show a pattern of impairment. And this is actually sort of a stepwise pattern. So we have, in each case, the children with dyslexia have got quite a significant impairment. The family risk children are not dyslexic have got a significant impairment, but it's less big than this one, but they do, they're doing significantly less well than the benchmark comparison group. And that kind of stepwise pattern signals that dyslexia is not an all or none disorder. It's not like measles. It's not that you've either got it or you haven't <coughs> got it. If it was that pattern, you'd see the dyslexics here, and you'd see these guys right down on the, um, on the x-axis. It's not an all or none disorder. It's much more a dimensional disorder. And in children who are at family risk, there are unaffected children, but they have some mild literacy problems, and then there are the affected children that have more significant literacy problems. Now, with that in mind, we can go back in time and think about, well, what did these two groups look like in the preschool period? And so on the next graph, I'm going to show their preschool language profile on three tasks that have typically been measured across studies. Test of language comprehension, which is basically understanding of vocabulary. A test of non-word repetition, the ability to repeat a non-word you've never heard before, like teg wapple. And a test of phonological awareness. So what is cat without the k at? And what you can see here is that both family risk groups are impaired in these preschool um, language tasks. Uh, once again, overall, the children with dyslexia show a greater impairment than the children without dyslexia. Although notice that uh, in this task, which involves repeating non-words, the two family risk groups show a similar size of impairment. Now, this pattern is quite interesting for two reasons. First of all, it goes somewhat against the notion that dyslexia is associated with a phonological deficit, which is very selective, because although these two tasks are actually phonological, we can see the children with um, dyslexia are impaired. They're also impaired on this broader language task that involves vocabulary development. So that's a relatively new finding, certainly in the last 10 years. Um, the second point um, to make, which is the similar to the point I made before, is that the family risk children who are not impaired are also showing language delay, and they're also showing phonological problems, but their phonological difficulties are most marked on a test of non-word repetition. <coughs> and this is somewhat consistent with the idea, which is, is in the developmental literature about language acquisition, that non-word repetition is a skill which is involved in uh, the acquisition of vocabulary. And this is consistent with the idea that with in people at family risk of dyslexia, they have this kind of problem with this non-word repetition language learning problem, and this might be having spillover effects on language comprehension and on phonological awareness. Okay, now what about these children when they go to school? What does their language look like then? Do we have more specificity, or do we still see this rather general pattern of language delay, including phonological difficulties? Well, here is the data from um, children in family risk studies of school age. And um, we can see here a slightly different pattern emerging. First of all, looking at phonological awareness, we can see that both family risk groups are impaired in phonological awareness, as they were in the preschool period. But here we see um, a difference in language comprehension. And the difference is that although the family risk children who go on to be dyslexic are still showing problems with language comprehension, that's no longer the case for children who are not dyslexic. So it's as though what's happening is that for children who are at family risk, some of them have language difficulties which resolve by school age, as shown here. And if those difficulties resolve, then even though they've still got some phonological difficulties, they can compensate for them, and they are not succumbing to very severe 
literacy problems. And we did say that we saw that they did have, do have mild literacy problems. They are on a dimension of dyslexia, but they're not severely enough impaired to um, fulfill any kind of criteria for dyslexia. <laughs> so these kinds of data suggest to us that having phonological difficulties is a um, kind of marker of familial dyslexia. And that carries a risk of poor reading. But if you have good language, as these children do, then this is a protective factor. And the good language in some way protects those children from succumbing to significant reading problems. OK, so just summing up from the meta-analysis, what we saw is that children at family risk of dyslexia, regardless of their outcome, show language delay in the preschool years, possibly stemming from problems with non-word repetition, sometimes called phonological memory. By school entry, within children at family risk, there is a divergence, and some children are resolving their general language problems, other children are not. Both groups continue to have phonological difficulties. So children who have phonological difficulties in the face of continuing language problems that tend to go on to be dyslexic, and the outcome of these children varies, um, with some children fulfilling criteria for dyslexia and some children not doing so. What seems critical then in thinking about the development of dyslexia is the state of the language system when a child comes to school. And if a child has a preschool language delay, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll have a reading problem, but if that delay isn't resolved by school entry and it's combined with a phonological difficulty, then they're likely to have reading problems. So this is a bit different from the rather simple causal model that I um, outlined at the beginning. And I think we have to recast our thinking about dyslexia in terms of not of deficits, but of risk factors. So the idea here is that the phonological difficulties that are associated with dyslexia mediate the impact of the genes associated with dyslexia on um, reading itself. Um, and this, this, the fact that they're a mediator, they're a kind of risk factor that, that they, this is, has a technical term. It's a sort of intermediate um, phenotype, and it's sometimes called an endophenotype. And a definition of, the, of an endophenotype is that it's a process which is associated with a disorder in the population. So the phonological difficulties are associated with dyslexia in the population. But in addition to that, an endophenotype is expressed at a higher rate in unaffected relatives of people with dyslexia than it is in the general population. And that's what we've seen here, that the phonological difficulties are seen not just in affected children with dyslexia, but also in unaffected children who inherit the same kind of risk from their um, genetic endowment. OK, so... Excuse me. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you do something about the microphone? Is the microphone working? Yes. Okay. All right, OK. Is, is it a problem? OK, sorry, I'll try and speak up a bit. bit. OK. Um, so, what is the relationship between dyslexia and language impairment? Because what I've said so far is that clearly language development and language delay is quite important in the etiology of dyslexia, but can we specify a bit more clearly um, how that impinges on learning to read? So, I'm going to turn now to discuss data from an ongoing project, Children at Family Risk of Dyslexia, which is ongoing in York. Um, and in this study, we've been following um, a large cohort of children from the, their, around about their uh, third birthday, from three and a half years, um, at annual intervals. And currently, we are following them up uh, when they're around eight years old. And soon, we'll, we'll know which of them have uh, developed dyslexia. Now, one of the things we are doing in this study is, alongside the development of children um, with um, family risk of dyslexia, we're also looking at children who, in the preschool years, have a speech and language difficulty. Because this is an interesting comparison group if we want to try to pull out the risk factors and the protective factors 
in relation to language in these children. And of course, the third group are children who are at low risk of reading disorders. And as you can see, this is a big project and it's run by a cast of thousands, some of whom are shown here and some of whom are not. OK, so let me say a little bit about the recruitment to this study, first of all. So we have three groups, typically developing children, children at family risk, and children with language impairment. We, we recruited those groups through advertisements <coughs> in magazines um, and uh, you know, the usual methods of recruitment. And in addition, we solicited uh, referrals from speech and language therapists <coughs> of children who had uh, a language impairment at the age of three. Regardless of how they came into the study, the first question we asked is, are these children at family risk of dyslexia? Because although we had children whose family was, was telling us they were at family risk, we needed to check that out, but also we had referrals of children with language impairment, and we actually didn't know about their parents. So we determined for each child whether or not they were at family risk through um, the self-report of their parents and objective testing. And then we had two answers to that. Some of them were at family risk and some of them weren't. And then all of the children underwent um, a battery of language assessments to determine whether or not they were uh, language impaired. And they were uh, designated as language impaired if they felt below, fell below criterion on two out of four of our oral language tests. And that was quite a standard procedure. So what we ended up with was a sample of children's 69 children from what we're going to call typically developing from families with no history of dyslexia, 32 children who had a, a language impairment but weren't at family risk of dyslexia, and then within the family risk group we had 83 children who just had a family risk of dyslexia but their language was normal, and we had a further 29 whoops, who uh, were at family risk and uh, language impaired. And the first thing we wanted to ask then was, if you're language impaired and you are at family risk of dyslexia, are you the same as children who are just language impaired, or are you less severe, or are you more severe? And that was the first um, set of analyses that we did, and the answer is, there's no difference. If you've got a preschool language impairment, irrespective of whether or not you've got a dyslexic parent, those language difficulties are exactly the same. So there's nothing uh, that we need to think about. There's, no, there's nothing to worry about about the separateness of these two groups. They really are the same group. One group we know has perhaps a slightly different genetic background. The second question we want to ask, and this is, bears on the question of whether we can demonstrate the validity of this idea of a phonological endophenotype or a phonological risk factor, <coughs> we want to compare children who are at family risk of dyslexia but who don't have any uh, language impairment with children who are typically developing. And what we expect if, if, there are, if dysle dyslexia is associated with a phonological endophenotype is that these children will do worse than controls on tests of language which tap phonological processes. And that was, in fact, what we found. Those children who were just at family risk did significantly less well than controls on tests of articulation that is speech, in naming, word repetition, non-word repetition, and certain aspects of expressive grammar where phonological skill is very important. So we are showing in this, in this group who are at family risk of dyslexia but who don't have a language impairment that nonetheless, in certain of the phonological aspects of language, they seem to have difficulty. And um, I think the way of kind of thinking about this is in terms of the skills, the language skills that are involved in learning to read. So as you all know, learning to read builds on a foundation in oral language, but different reading skills depend to differing extents on different language abilities. Learning to decode, which is the stumbling block block for children with dyslexia depends strongly upon phonological skills, that speech processing aspect of language, whereas understanding what you read depends much more upon broader language, language comprehension, vocabulary, and so on. And what we find is that in the preschool years, children at family risk of dyslexia tend to have poor phonology, but their um, 
that their sort of comprehension is, is okay. They don't have, they don't fulfill criteria for language impairment, but they do have difficulty on phonological aspects of language. And that places them at, at strong risk of dyslexia. Well, as, of course, does the fact they have um, the genetic endowment. But then remember, we also had family risk children who had a broader language impairment. And I said they're just like language impaired children. So here we have children who carry the same phonological risk as their siblings, but who also have poorer language. So here we can see that the risk of dyslexia exists at all points on the spectrum of language or language ability. Hence, it's not as specific as we've once thought. Now, what about other risk factors? Is it just that these children have got language difficulties in the preschool years? Well, we turn to ask this question by... Um, we were particularly interested in looking at aspects of motor development and aspects of um, executive attention because in children with dyslexia, motor impairments are often implicated and, and diagnosed. The term dyspraxia is often uh, used alongside dyslexia. And also, often these children have attention problems or even, at the extreme end, ADHD. So we wanted to see how um, motor skills and attention <coughs> related to these different language profiles we were finding. So we had a battery of motor tests, um, fine motor tests involving posting coins, threading beans, and tracing between lines. Um, and we also asked parents to rate their children's motor control. And in the domain of attention, we had a self-regulation task. Essentially, it's called the head, toes, knees and shoulders task. But you, you get the child to copy you. So touch your head, touch your toes. Child copies you. Then you say, OK, now do the opposite. If I touch my head, you touch your toes. So they have to regulate their uh, movements and uh, in the opposite way to the way in which you are. It's quite a difficult task. We had a task of visuospatial working memory in which they had to reconstruct um, a series of a, a pattern of blocks. We had a visual search task and a sustained attention task where they had to listen for animal sounds, which went on and on and on, and every time they heard a dog barking, they had to press a button. So these are all tasks which are demanding of executive attention. And let me show you what we found. We, we looked in these different domains and we looked for children who were showing deficits. And this is our typically developing, if you like, normal group. And as you'd expect, most of them are free of motor impairments and attention impairments. There is a few, there's about 6% of children, who are affected on those kinds of tasks. When we look at children at family risk of dyslexia, we see that 82% are free of motor difficulties or attention problems, but we have about 18% children are affected. And when we look at children with language impairment, regardless of uh, whether or not they also carry family risk, you can see you get quite a high prevalence of motor disorders and also disorders of um, executive attention. So in this group, 46% of children who've got language impairments also have problems with motor skills and executive attention. So within this kind of framework where we're talking about risk factors for reading difficulties, the group who were here in terms of their language, who had poor phonology and poor language, also have problems with motor development and executive attention, which are important um, difficulties for them in terms of school learning. We get a much weaker association with those um, motor and attentional deficits in the group who are just at family risk. So we've seen in this longitudinal study, and I've just reported the first two phases of the longitudinal study, that we see quite a lot of heterogeneity among children who are at family risk of dyslexia. And perhaps that's not surprising because there's probably a lot of heterogeneity amongst their parents as well. Um, about a third of them have really quite pervasive language difficulties. Two thirds are free of any gross language difficulty, but they have more specific phonological problems. The children with the more global language impairments also have difficulties with motor skill development and the development of attention both the skills that are going to affect their progress at school. So can we pull these findings together to move us towards a causal model of dyslexia? <coughs> well, that's what I'm going to try and do now. Just to summarise the main findings, what the meta-analysis showed us is that a phonological deficit 
is an endophenotype or a risk factor for dyslexia. And in the preschool years, dyslexia seems to be associated with poor non-word repetition, poor phonological memory. In our ongoing welcome study, we've shown that phonological deficits are associated with family risk of dyslexia, and so that's consistent with this view. And a hypothesis which I think is worth pursuing is that the non-word repetition deficit that is observed in the preschool period causes a delayed acquisition of language skills and downstream effects on phonological awareness which persist in children at family risk regardless of their reading outcome. We've also seen evidence of comorbidities, that is that some children with dyslexia also have um, impairments beyond the language continuum in motor skill development and attention. So how can we put this together? Well, um, when I was at school, I learned that the genotype is the genetic makeup of a person and the phenotype is their behavioral characteristics, and that was all very simple. What I'm showing here is what's much more likely to be the case when we look at neurodevelopmental disorders like dyslexia, and that is that we're talking about disorders that are associated with many, many genes which have very small effects. But those genes probably code for a number of different risk factors or endophenotypes, shown here, one, two, three. And the endophenotype mediates the impact of, this, of these genes on behavior. And this phenotype that you get um, depends upon the mix of risk factors that you, that you uh, have. And in the case of dyslexia, the, 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 the mix of the risk and protective factors that you bring to the task of reading. Now, the primary risk factor for dyslexia is a phonological deficit. I, I still think that the data are consistent with that. So if you have a phonological endophenotype, you're going to end up with a dyslexic profile. It may not be severe enough for you to get a diagnosis, but you're going to be on a continuum which is not somewhere a, you know, below average reading. Your outcome is going to be much more likely to be diagnosed as dyslexia if you bring additional risks to the task of reading. <laughs> so if you also have some kind of endophenotype that underpins a language deficit. So we saw that dyslexia in our family risk review was much more likely for children who have phonological difficulties and language difficulties. And then you can also think there will be some children who also have, say, attention problems, and those problems will further compound their uh, reading difficulties so that you get quite a severe manifestation of uh, dyslexia. So what so I've outlined there is what you would call a causal theory. And a causal theory, of course, is a very good starting point for intervention. And in Centre for Reading and Language, we had a bit of a motto about the virtuous <laughs> circle. Uh, if you have a good idea of what causes a disorder, you can develop an intervention which is theoretically motivated in terms of its content um, to um, remedy the uh, condition. And when you do the intervention, if you do, it, if you do it properly using a randomized design, then you have a way of testing your theory. Essentially, if you've got your theory right and your intervention right, you should be able to improve the outcome for the disorder. And then if you're lucky, you can get the intervention embedded into practice. So what about children at family risk of dyslexia? What kinds of intervention should we be thinking about for these children? Well, let me just step back for a moment and talk about how we thought about intervention for children in our welcome study who were um, entering school, many of them, um, at high risk of reading difficulties. Well, there are two strands, really, to um, our thinking here, and these... Um, provide a kind of historical perspective on the um, work of intervention in the uh, Department of Psychology here. So the first study that was done was really a pioneering study done by my colleagues Peter Hatcher, Charles Hume and Andy Ellis. And they um, conducted what was the first, I think, randomised trial of reading intervention in the uh, UK right back in 1994 when they took the bottom 10% of seven-year-olds in uh, the county of Cumbria uh, in terms of their reading development. And they randomly assigned those children to receive one of three sorts of intervention. And at the time, they were 
um, testing a causal model of uh, reading impairment. We suggested it was due to a, a single phonological deficit, <coughs> a specific phonological deficit. The three interventions, what, one group of children received um, six months of a twice weekly intervention from highly skilled teachers that just focused on improving reading. It was reading based, it was based on reading recovery ideas. The second group in that time received training in phonological awareness, the ability to reflect on and organize the sounds of spoken words. And a third group received an intervention which was an integrated program of phonological awareness training in the context of structured reading. And they had a control group. They followed the children for uh, nine months. And the, um, sorry, the uh, intervention, which was the most significant with the longest lasting effects, was the integrated program, which involved training phonological awareness in the context of uh, structured reading practice, linking between phonemes and letters and words. Subsequent to that, Peter Hatcher <coughs> modified the program to make it suitable for delivery by uh, teaching assistants. Um, and um, with funding from North Yorkshire uh, County Council, we ran a randomised trial which showed that um, this intervention, when delivered by teaching assistants, was indeed effective. So this was a proof of principle for the local authority about the efficacy of the uh, reading intervention programme. <coughs> and since then, North Yorkshire have been rolling out this programme um, consistently on a year-on-year -year basis. I think they now have reading intervention um, trained teaching assistants in all of their schools. And on average, the local authority report that children make eight months reading progress over ten weeks. And in Greg Brooks' What Works, it's listed as one of the top 26 interventions um, in terms of the evidence base. So we think we have a good idea on how we can help children with reading difficulties um, in the early phases um, of schooling. But about 10 years ago, we turned our attention to thinking about spoken language intervention because language is the foundation for reading, and it occurred to us, well, why should we wait for children to have reading problems when we know earlier on they've got language difficulties? So we embarked upon a series of studies funded by the Nuffield Foundation and led by uh, Claudine Boyer crane who's now here in the Department of Education. Um, and these um, studies were targeted children in the early years um, to really try to develop a foundation for reading and perhaps more broadly for education. They have three main components, work on listening comprehension, work on building vocabulary, which is obviously part of comprehension, and work on narrative skills. And we've de demonstrated in two or three trials that these uh, skills can be um, effectively trained by trained uh, teaching assistants. So when it came to our welcome sample and the children there who, had, who were coming to school with poor reading and also poor oral language, it was natural to think about combining these approaches and delivering an intervention which combined the essential ingredients of reading intervention with the essential ingredients of language intervention. And uh, this trial was led by um, Fiona Duff, who uh, devised the programme in collaboration with the other people in the CRL team. What we did in the welcome study is that we um, delivered a daily intervention to children um, at high risk of reading problems in year one. Um, three times a week there were individual reading sessions and twice a week there was small group work on language. And again, this was all delivered by trained teaching assistants who we, we supported using telephone support. Just to give you a rough idea of the ingredients of these interventions, uh, the reading intervention is pretty much Peter Hatcher's reading intervention, although adapted um, to take account of the fact that there is now a lot of systematic phonics in the mainstream curriculum, which wasn't, there wasn't back in 1994. Essentially what we think of in terms of describing reading intervention is it's a reading sandwich. It's the, the, a lesson starts off with reading from an easy book to build sight vocabulary, a book at the instructional level, 
for practice with emerging skills, and the session closes reading a new book, which will become the easy book for the next um, session and also involves um, the opportunity to take a, a running record of the child's um, reading for error analysis and, and to develop strategies. In the middle, there's work on sight word learning and also training in letter knowledge, phonological awareness and phonic decoding. The language intervention uh, involves the three components of listening, vocabulary instruction, and in this particular version of language intervention, we involved, uh, we, we included um, the ability to, uh, we, we encourage children to develop their spoken narrative and also their written narrative skills by listening to books, retelling the story, planning for writing, and where they could independent writing or, if not, uh, guided writing. Now, this trial was quite a, a monster to implement. Um, it involved screening uh, our welcome <laughs> sample by this time when they were in year one, were distributed among 96 schools. The screening took, part in the, took place in the winter of 2011, which you may remember was probably the worst uh, winter on record for snow in North Yorkshire. We thought we would lose the entire team, but actually they did soldier on and they did manage to screen um, 117 of our 148 um, clinical cases to identify the 60 children with the lowest reading skills in year one in our uh, longitudinal cohort. Those children were in 50 schools and they were randomly allocated either to receive um, an 18-week programme of intervention or to receive a nine-week programme of intervention. And the children on the nine-week programme, if you like, were a waiting control group for the first group. So the 18-week group started off, and after nine weeks, for the first nine weeks, the other group had had no intervention, and then they started. So it was an unusual design, constrained somewhat by the um, constraints of, of, of the project that we were um, conducting. So what I'm going to show you now are the findings from the trial after the first nine weeks. Now, nine weeks is actually pretty short for an intervention, um, and it's a shorter intervention than we would normally do. But the results are shown here. And just to um, explain what this graph shows, it's not unlike the graphs I showed you about effect size. We've got along here the things that we measured before and after the intervention on the y-axis, have now got a deficit, we've actually got a gain, and it's the um, gain made by the group who are getting the intervention compared to the controls when you adjust for baseline. <coughs> These bars are the 95 confidence intervals, and if they go across the axis, it means there's no significant difference between the intervention group and the control group. So you can see we've got a lot of measures here, and I'm not claiming they're all significant by any means, but we've got actually... Uh, statistically significant improvements for children at high risk of dyslexia in their letter sound knowledge, their phoneme awareness, their score on an early word reading test, and their ability to spell phonetically. They're the reading measures, and then they also um, showed significant gains um, in the vocabulary that they were taught. Now, at each point, you'll see two bars, a blue bar and a red bar, the blue bar shows the um, average gain of children who were about average in, in, in terms of the intervention group. So the intervention group in, included children of all levels of severity of reading, and that the mean is the blue bar. But you can also look to see how well children who are one standard deviation below the mean do. That is, how well do children who are more severely affected do in the intervention? And that's the red bar. And what that shows you is that this intervention is actually significantly more effective for children who are more severely affected, which is an unusual pattern, but I think quite an important pattern. It shows that these children really benefited from the intervention. So that's the good news. Um, a short nine-week intervention targeting letter knowledge, phonological awareness, and language skills had positive effects. And the effects were stronger for children who were more severely affected. Um, we also found significant gains in taught vocabulary, but, but to be honest, we were disappointed that there was no generalisation to other language skills, which we have found in our other interventions. And we 
can infer from this that this intervention was actually too short to really have the beneficial effects on language, which we would like to see. And typically, our language interventions have been at least for 20 weeks. So just to conclude then, um, what I've told you is a much more complicated story about dyslexia than the one I would have told you if you ever came to the Merchant Adventures lecturer 10 years ago when dyslexia was a phonological deficit and that was all you needed to know. The phonological deficit I've recast as an endophenotype or if you like a risk factor for dyslexia. And we can see it in the preschool years in children who are at family risk. Uh, the marker of dyslexia risk appears to be a deficit in non-word repetition. And I think the uh, hypothesis is that this deficit causes delayed acquisition of language skills and further down the line effects on the development of phonological awareness. But the phonological awareness deficit alone isn't going to precipitate a child into being dyslexic. Compensation is possible for that child if their oral language difficulties are strong. And even if they've had a language delay in the preschool years, as long as the difficulty is resolved by approximately school age, then the outcome can be good. More generally, dyslexia is the outcome of multiple deficits. It's more likely to be identified when more than one deficit is present. The way I think about it is that risk factors accumulate towards a threshold, and it's that when you reach the threshold, a child gets identified as having a dyslexic <coughs> difficulty. And what these data, both from our meta-analysis and from our ongoing <coughs> study, are beginning to suggest is that the status of the language system at school entry is a critical factor in determining the outcome of children with familial dyslexia. In terms of educational implications, well, the diagnosis of dyslexia is difficult. At the end of the day, it probably is going to depend on the degree of functional impairment a child shows, or an, or an adult shows, whether or not they are usefully described as dyslexic. The criteria are always going to be externally agreed. There's nothing intrinsic to the condition that would allow you to say, these signs equal dyslexia, these signs equal not dyslexia. The second important implication for education is that evidence-based interventions can ameliorate the effects of the phonological deficit and foster stronger literacy skills. So what we have here, in a way, is a bit of a vicious cycle. We can't actually do anything about our genes. <coughs> what these genes for dyslexia appear to do is to specify um, something that I've called a phonological endophenotype. And that endophenotype is associated with a problem with non-word repetition, which causes language delay, poor phoneme awareness, poor letter learning, and ultimately poor decoding. And of course, that's not the end of it, because that cycle then leads into a downward spiral of poor attainment, poor motivation, poor educational, and poor career prospects. So it's absolutely a moral, moral imperative, as far as I'm concerned, to break this cycle and make it into a virtuous circle. And I think we can do that. There are at least three points in the cycle where we can uh, break it. One is when a child shows language delay. Speech and language therapy can help, can help a lot. Um, and we've also shown that early language intervention can help. We can also help with poor letter learning. This is just my excuse to show you my grandchild and her <laughs> letter learning. Um, but a child um, with a familial risk of dyslexia really will benefit from learning letters. And what we know from our study is that many of the families where there is dyslexia are doing a lot of letter learning with their children. And lastly, if a child shows poor decoding, then they can benefit from a period of evidence-based reading intervention. So at this point just leaves me to thank you for listening. Obviously, this research couldn't be done without the support of children, parents, teaching assistants, teachers, schools, speech and language therapists. I'd like to particularly thank um, my group, the Centre for Reading and Language, and Charles Hume, the co-director, the graduate students and research assistants, uh, Monica, Melby Lervag, and, of course, the Wellcome Trust for supporting it. Um, and um, I hope you've all been given... <coughs> Uh, a bookmark uh, advertising our YouTube campaign, which is about raising awareness of language learning impairments. Thank you. <laughs>